<laughs> Hi everyone, I'm here with Laura Pennington and she's a nutrition coach and wellness coach and she's agreed to have a chat with us today and share some of her knowledge with us. So hi Laura, thanks for joining us. Hi Beth, thank you for having me. Well that's a pleasure, we really appreciate your time and um, sharing with us what, what you've learned about being well and healthy. So um, before we get started into um, your works and what you your nutrition coaching and that kind of thing, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, your life, what you like to do? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I'm a proud mother of two and uh, happily married to Chris. And basically in 2010, when the children were 10 and 12, we moved to a little place called Firefly and it was on 100 acres. It's three hours north of Sydney. So we had a big tree change mm -hmm. and we really embraced everything about getting our hands dirty and the soil and establishing a farm. So we built our house and we built the infrastructure and then, yeah, set about basically trying to grow things, which wasn't always easy. <laughs> we learned it's all about the soil. And, um, yeah, so that, that took us on the journey of the next 11 years. Um, and then last year we moved to the USA. So for Chris's work, so I'm temporarily for, for a few years in Denver, Colorado. So we're missing home and the farm, which is all still there. And our children are managing very well there without us. They're now... Um, 2022 20 and, 22. Yeah. and uh, yeah but we're really thriving here and having a great time hiking in the Rockies yeah. and of course I've taken the time to do extra research and study. Hmm. That would have been an amazing um, upbringing for your children on the farm. Oh yeah definitely definitely mm -hmm. I've learned so many things they can use power tools <laughs> tractors <Yeah>. by horses <laughs> and um, yeah. hopefully some of the nutrition stuff's rubbing off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my my kids are um, 17 and 15, so um, I was, even last night, I cooked a curry and Ben said, what did you put in that? Because I'm saying, eat, <laughs> eat up all that soup, eat up all this, the juice, because I actually blended a whole lot of veggies. He's like, you did something sneaky. I'm like, oh, you know me well. <laughs> I know, and it's so weird. You wonder where they get that aversion to vegetables from. Oh. Uh, I, how, I had French friends when our kids were babies and they did such a good job. They just gave them steamed veggies from the start. Yeah. Um, hot chips and things. So, yeah, maybe that's the way, the French way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, let's uh, talk about your nutrition coaching. So who do you, who do you help and um, what, what do you do? How do you okay, help? well, as you described at the beginning, I'm a nu nutrition coach, but also happily to be described as a wellness coach or nourishment coach. Yeah. And um, basically, I help anybody who would like to be guided to a healthier lifestyle and healthier living. Mm, that would be such a great job because you'd be such an important, you know, when, when you get health right, so many other areas of their life can change. So it's so rewarding seeing that with people. Absolutely. It's a real game changer for some people. Of course, it can be frustrating when you know how yeah. to help someone. It might be a friend and you can't say anything. Yeah. Um, but mostly when you have um, a client or a friend who you're helping on board, then it's super satisfying to see them message you and say, look, I feel better or I changed this yeah. or that really worked. And yeah. Yeah. So when did you first um, become interested in health and wellness? I know you mentioned that sort of all started when you moved to the farm and you got into growing your own food. Is that when things started to change? Well, that definitely was a huge point um, at where, you know, the, the interest really took off um, and the knowledge was really getting compounded. Um, but I guess it probably started with my mother. Um, she could not hand us food without saying what was in it. <laughs> That is probably off-putting when we were younger. Yeah. So we ran a dinner table and she couldn't put something down without going, come on, have some, have some more. It's got vitamin B. This has yeah. got vitamin B. It's good for you. It'll help you grow. I have to confess, I couldn't have been absolutely less interested when I was kind of 16 yeah. at that. I wish I had been because maybe it would have helped, you know, clearer skin and energy and all those great things. But at that age, you think you're invincible. And yeah, yeah. what does mum and dad know? Um, but it's funny because now I do that to my children. <laughs> And my daughter's become really, really interested. In, in fact, she's my social media um, yeah, person. So she's, she's right behind it all and, and the whole eat, eating healthy. And in fact, my son will often Snapchat me um, pictures of meals 
you know, yeah. he's got brown mundi and a couple of veggies. So I think it's rubbing off, but definitely with my mum. But also a long time ago, I saw this documentary and it just sort of always, it just struck a chord. And it was about um, basically it's a Middle Eastern lady, a lady from the Middle East. I can't remember where. Um, I think it might have been um, Syria. Anyway, they'd moved, her story was they moved with a family to the US. And within about, I think it was six to 12 months, like I said, it was a long time ago, I saw this show. Um, within about six to 12 months, her son developed autism, basically, to, to cut a long story short. And she did a lot of investigation and research and realized, or she came to her conclusion that she felt it was the food, mm. in particular, genetically modified food, lots of corn. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of these corn derivatives now, derivatives now, which are sort of leftovers and fillers like cornstarch and that kind of thing so she went on this big journey connected with other women and she managed to find other women in exactly the same boat where they'd moved from their country where they had all these vegetables and yep. ferments and different types of foods moved to the u.s had the american diet and um their kids developed autism so they formed a support group and did a lot of their own research which it then shot forward years and years of working with doctors who they finally found um, would potentially help them. And basically they found the key uh, was the gut brain link so that they learned that eating healthily um, fed the gut and that equally um, uh, would deal with all the messages between the gut and the brain. It's amazing. So um, that fascinated me. So then it led me on a journey to, to research more. Hmm interesting how those little things or like a documentary or something like that can just start a ripple effect of um learning more things learning more and absolutely and i think something piques your interest doesn't it and then you just keep going and also there was a couple of other when i moved to firefly which is, is where our farm is i met some amazing really like-minded people and mm -hmm. one lady was a staunch advocate of fermented foods and uh, probiotic drinks and yep. she suggested i read a book you tell how long ago, yeah, 11 years, a lot's changed, it'll all be internet now, but I read this book um, by Sandra Katz, and I highly recommend anyone watching this looks him up. He's still a major advocate of ferments. He calls himself, I think it's a fermented food revivalist, yeah. and it's about the slow food movement and just good food, how it feeds the gut, yeah. and then it's all about everything that the gut can do for, the, um, for all the functions in the body. So yeah, there was lots of sort of moments like that and people I've met along the way. I, actually, I think one of the best ones has to be a land care meeting I went to and the presenter was a farmer. And this was fascinating for me because he linked, he really made a link between the animals and the humans. Yeah. And he was talking largely to a group of farmers about the importance of gut health in their cattle and their animals. And he linked it right through to the gut health of the worms in the worm farm and how important it was that the worms were healthy because then you get the compost, the worm tea, worm juice. Yeah. And that was used to fertilize the paddocks and how it links right back to the microbes in the soil. So that for me was amazing because I thought, oh yeah, of course the gut health of the soil literally comes right through to the gut health and the, the good health of people. Wow. So that really, all these things sort of spurred me on to keep learning more. And of course, seeing the paddock to plate produce we were creating um, and the health of that and the animals, it just all linked together. Yeah, it's amazing to trace things back, back and back, you know, really understanding what you're putting into your body and how it mm. affects you. So Yeah, it makes you realise, yeah. Mm. I can hear you talking about using food to heal the body. Um, that's an interesting thought. So could you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think most people have heard of the well-known quote by Hippocrates, mm -hmm. which he lived well over 2,000 years ago and was known as the father of medicine. And he was a big advocate for basically using food as medicine. So he said, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. And it certainly doesn't mean I shun modern medicine. I'm actually open to all tools if someone is getting healthy. I'm very careful to say that. Um, someone might be on a medication, they might really need that. And it's also their choice. That's no problem. However, I think I see nutrition as just giving you the best chance. So I have actually met people personally um, over the last 10 or 20 years um, who have actually healed themselves literally from cancer with, uh, you know, various vegetable juices and that kind of thing. Um, some of them did or didn't also have the conventional medicine. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, well, research shows, I mean, there's been huge population studies around the world over the last 20 years of people um, and their diets. And it definitely points to a good diet with a lot of vegetables um, reduces your risk. Of course, any of us could get cancer or something next week. We yeah. hope we don't. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, definitely the statistics are there and the research is there to show you're greatly reducing your risk if you basically have a wide variety of very good foods. Yeah. And my philosophy is food is very much about holistic nutrition, which actually encompasses all food groups. Yeah. So um, although I do help and support people who want to try other diets, might be a vegan, they might have a very meat heavy diet, mm -hmm. I can still help and guide them um, because a lot of it is is actually about just the quality of the food you're eating. So for instance, the meat um, that people are eating, I'm a vegetarian myself, it doesn't mean I think it's the best way, it's just something I did a very long time ago. Um, but for anyone wanting to eat meat and animal products, I always say please only get grass fed and pasture raised eggs and meat. Yeah. Uh, obviously it's not only humane to the animal, but the meat itself is a lot healthier for your body and um, your body will yeah, react to those foods a lot better. In mm -hmm. fact, meat has actually been shown to have um, more omega-6 and less omega-3 if it's factory raised. So mm -hmm. I'm just a staunch, staunch advocate for yeah, healthy nutrition across the food groups. Yeah. And I also noticed that um, you, you recommend if people do eat meat, you know, but 80 to 90% of their diet as vegetables. Yeah, 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 totally. So yeah. that, again, is um, not necessarily something I've, I've personally always thought. This is research-based. Mm -hmm. I've learned this, um, studied a wide range of populations. Um, some of the people watching this may have heard of the Blue Zones. I'm not sure if you've heard of those. Okay, There's yeah. about five, possibly six um, regions around the world where people have been studied and they've been found to live for a very long time and very, very healthily. Yeah. And yeah, they just had some key elements in their lifestyle, which, uh, mm. and one of them was a very heavy plant-based diet. Some yeah. of them ate meat, some of those zones ate no meat at all. Um, some ate pork, some didn't, some drank wine and some didn't. So there were a lot of varieties, but they definitely centered their life around good, healthy, local produce, low in toxins, low in pesticides, yeah. and uh, lots of beans and greens, basically. Yeah, and I saw a quote from um, Dr. Mark Hyman the other day, um, and he say he said, um, "Think of meat like a condiment, like a, yeah, a yes, meat that meat right. it. And I thought that's a really um, a good point. You know, like most of the most of your what you eat, most of your plate should be vegetables, and then think of the meat as not the not the hero of it, but just you add on a side part." Absolutely. I think that's what we're trying to, all of us people who believe in the, this healthy balanced diet and the plant foods is um, totally about that, trying to put the healthy food at the centre and yeah. then let the other, well, the meat can be really healthy, but let the meats and things yeah. fall around the side a little bit more just so to make sure you're getting all those nutrients in that fibre. Yeah. Could you, you did mention a little before about... Um, the bacteria in the gut and why how that can help with brain function and um, keeping us well could you talk a little bit more about that because i know it's it's fascinating i did hear um i was reading the other day and they were saying that there's more bacteria in us than actual our cells so there's more of them than there is of us <laughs> Yeah, I actually read a statistic, another one recently that suggested it was 90% of bacteria, fungus yeah. and viruses and 10% human cells. I mean, I'm sure a trillion cells here and there, so it's a little bit hard to count. But it does make sense that we need to look after the all the, this microbiome, basically. So there are literally trillions of them and they form a rich ecosystem, which performs most of the functions in our body or they instigate. So basically the bacteria in your gut will instigate hormone messengers to send messages around the body to tell it how to function. So for optimal functioning. And there has been a lot more research into the gut brain link and the link between the gut and various health disorders. And it's really exciting to think that people with health disorders such as Parkinson's um, or even people who who haven't got that could pre prevent these sort of
disorders um, and many chronic illnesses have been shown to help through, through gut health. Um, that could be diabetes, it could be depression. And one of the amazing things, that, um, these are two good reasons actually to look after your gut. These are my two favorite ones, I'd say. One is most of the serotonin we produce in our bodies is formed in the gut. So we need serotonin, obviously, to be happy and for good digestion, mood regulation and good sleep. Um, who doesn't want those things? Um, and it's around, I think, 90%, um, don't quite quote me on that one, of your immune cells actually reside along the gut. So mm -hmm. another good reason, who doesn't want a good immune? So if we look, there's a lot more going on in there than, than people thought, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. And it's, there's more and more research going on. So... Um improving our gut health if if when if we if someone feels like they're not healthy in their gut maybe not eating enough vegetables we can reverse that can we and eat, like build up more good bacteria through fermented foods or do we need uh, probiotics yeah, to some extent um they they did a study a little while ago on um basically i think it was chimpanzees and they took uh basically a stool samples from ones in a zoo and ones in the wild. And they found that the ones in the zoo had about 10% of the variety of bacteria, good bacteria than the ones in the wild. So they started to look more at humans and found indeed that some populations of people who were living a little bit closer to nature still um, had much bigger, not just more bacteria, but actually a wider variety of them than people on what's called sometimes a sad diet, a standard Western diet, standard, yeah. standard American diet, that's it. Um, so it sounds like I'm picking on <laughs> the American diet. It's just sort of a, a, a term for, for, you know, that sort of Western food that's um, yeah. largely processed. Um, and so, yes, so the answer to can you improve it? Yes, you can. For some people, that's going to be harder than others. Um, some people may need pro probiotics. A lot of people can improve it with, probiotic food. So that's your sauerkraut, your kimchi, even Vegemite is classed as a fermented food, blue cheese, um, kefir, uh, kombucha. I love kombucha, yeah. um, which is great for people who don't want dairy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's all sorts of ways to, to feed the gut biome. You can also feed them literally with fiber. So when you're feeding yourself, you're actually feeding those guys. Right. And there's a fabulous video. I'll give you the link afterwards by a lady called Shilpa Ravella. And she does a little five minute snippet explaining this. It's a great little sort of animation. And it literally shows how the, the gut bugs are munching away on all the fibre. And um, then they thrive. If you don't give them enough fibre, they start to die. Mm -hmm. And some bad bacteria can thrive. So again, it's going to affect all those amazing messages and functions going on in the body. Um, and also create actual uh, gut gut issues as well. Mm. Well, that's that's great. That's good tips. So we can all add a little bit of um, kimchi to our salad this, or our vegetables. Yeah, this, this might be a little bit too much information because it's again quite a new thing. But I've heard loads of good reports. If people are really in dire straits, they've got a really uh, debilitating condition, they can't get well. They've been trying for years, and they, their gut health can't be improved with all the health professionals helping them. Um, and that is a faecal transplant. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that sounds really interesting. And I, I think that I'd recommend if anyone's in really a bad way with their health, uh, have a chronic illness and they can't get on top of it to talk to their, their doctor about that. Yeah. So I was just thinking, um, a lot of people I talk to, you know, they get all this knowledge about this diet and that diet and, um, they know they should eat more vegetables, but sometimes it's really hard to um, start a change, especially when if you've been eating a certain way, you think, oh, yes, I know my gut health is important or I know I could be doing better just because you want that immunity, because you want to live well and not be tired or sleep better. So do you have, what do you, how do you help your clients with a few practical ideas on implementing these changes? Um, if someone really wants to make a change, I think, so I'm just going to, I made a little list here. Yeah. Um, they, these are the kind of general tips. Um, basically, it's to say that everyone is different. And I think it's really important that people remember that from the start. Try not to compare yourself to friends and other people. We all have our own health story. Um, I have always had to work a lot harder 
for my fitness and strength and clarity of skin and mind and all those things than say my husband who does almost nothing to contribute to those things and then can you know bounce yeah. around outside on the ski slopes and, and go on a hike with absolutely no problem whatsoever yeah. um so what they definitely start by saying to people um we're all different the main question i then ask them is what's your why knowing knowing why you want to improve your health is health is such a key because that's the motivator really isn't it Absolutely. So that's, that's definitely one of the first questions I'd say. We'll ask them to find their why yeah. and what their health goal is. So for some people, they might say, I just want to feel better and have better sleep, clearer mm -hmm. skin, better thinking, more energy. Someone might be trying to get pregnant and have struggled. Mm -hmm. Someone also might have a family history and they're scared. You know, the um, younger people in their family have known to get cancer or heart disease or diabetes. So that might be their motivator, actually prevention, which is a good thing. Um, for some people, it's actually environmental. Um, I know lots of people have changed their diet and their lifestyle for environmental reasons. Um, less meat, less packaging, grow their own food, that kind of thing. Um, it also could be enough for some people to know that about half of Americans and about 40% of Australians have a chronic illness. So if we let that statistic sink in for a minute, that's yeah, horrifying yeah. and it's going up. Yeah. And what's super sad about this is um, it, most of them are largely preventable. Yeah. So know. not all, of course, the, there's always going to be some bad luck um, or other mm -hmm. factors. Um, but yeah, I have definitely read research where people have reversed or, uh, yeah, or basically reversed or healed their chronic illness. Yeah. Um, through food so yeah it definitely depends on their health journey their goals um there was a couple of other things um oh yeah that's right i wanted just to mention as well if someone is looking to really change the scope of what they're eating their lifestyle is to actually start today and one of the things to start in the calendar setting some time aside to actually think it through not getting to sunday night having a great weekend and going oh, i haven't thought about food for the week mm -hmm. and then staying in those habits of just grab and go when you're starving um so definitely set time aside to plan meals and to exercise um again like we said it's really hard to change your routine if you do no exercise start with 10 minutes so you're creating a new habit loop mm -hmm. so these habits are really important they're very almost as important as as aiming for the for the right foods. Um, oh, sorry. No, sorry, you go. I was just thinking um, when you do you want to incorporate a new habit, sometimes it's good to link it to something you already do. So I often talk to people about with movement. So if it's just, a, if they're going to do just a 10 minute stretch or something, you link it to something that is just part of your day. So you can kind of like buddy it up with something. So it might be before I hop into bed, I do. I do my 10 minute Pilates stretch or, you know, um, after I brush my teeth in the morning, I give myself 10 minutes. So it's just like adding, adding a routine to something that you already is part of your life. I think that's kind of helpful. Yeah. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? And these days as well, you can set little timers and yeah, or you can be a sticky note person, but you can do all sorts of things as a little reminder. And like you said, sometimes it's just trying to find that 10 minutes. Um, to squeeze that new thing in. Um, and like you said, changing the routine. So that's something that definitely people can start today. They could do 10 minutes pilates at the end of the day, 10 minute walking at the beginning. They can also, you can also do smaller things. So if you know that you're gonna start looking at the fridge at nine or 10 o'clock for morning tea, just make sure right in front there is something healthy to have. Um, your Greek yogurt, your, your fruit or something to snack on or put it out by the kettles. You know, when you come out to make your tea or coffee, you've got the snack planned right in front of you. So, so any of these habits, and I, I would suggest starting today, don't say next week after the holiday, after start. And, you know, the things we just talked about or something simple like taking a mandarin to work so that before you have your egg and bacon burger or the thing that you're actually trying to change at lunchtime, yeah. you have mandarin, you're introducing a new thing or it might be as simple as a glass of lemon water mm -hmm. so just something to change those routines and kick start the new healthy you yeah i think um that's the thing is the kick start because mm. I, I always find that um if you have a look at the whole big picture you think i need to change my diet i've got to get moving more um it can seem so overwhelming yeah, and then once you do one thing whether it's a 10 minute pilates movement it kind of shifts your mindset. And then so 
you don't just want to go and grab something unhealthy to eat because then you you do think, oh, I feel really nourished and I feel like I've done that deep breathing. I will grab the mandarin. And it, it, it's really just that first. So true. Changes everything. And often people say to me, they come and they say, I want to lose weight in Pilates. Can you lose weight? And I think, well, you can, you would definitely tone up through the exercises, but I think it's more the shift that happens in your mind that yeah. causes people to um, feel healthier and often they do slim down but it's not that's not um i don't ever see that as the main goal but um it definitely there's the ripple effect on on your life i think you really struck on something there that in fact i was going to mention later it's super mm -hmm. important and it's sort of a big part of my philosophy as well i hardly ever mention weight unless the person really wants yeah. to if you just focus on the food nourishing the cells healing your body and helping it perform all its functions properly, the weight loss or the weight management goal can come as a secondary mm -hmm. issue. And it often comes without having to think too hard about it. Um, Cause that's often where things unravel when someone focuses totally on something they can't have or, or achieve. So mm -hmm. yeah, I really like that. Yeah. And I think, um, I think you're also talking about all the things you can have, you know, like mm -hmm. rather than um, eliminating things in your diet, I think that can be a really good key as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very key thing. In fact, I'm very much about that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whether you want to call it the, the plus diet, the add more or the, the crowding out, I was going to get to crowding out later. Um, and that definitely makes sense because so many people never change um, what they want to eat ideally because you just keep going back to what's familiar and or you feel really really deprived i think a lot of people have done this um i've never been on a weight loss diet but i've certainly tried to change so for instance a bit less cheese i have a very mm. big passion for cheese <laughs> so you have say three no cheese days and then on the fourth day it's all you can think about because yeah. you get more and more deprived so it's probably better just to to reduce it or crowd it out with other things so instead mm. of having a pile of cheese and crackers you've got kind of a plate filled with interesting little green uh, vegetables and fruits or nuts and things and then half the amount of cheese so um yeah and have you heard of the uh, law of diminishing effects mm, it's remind me. Like, um, if you're really craving cheese rather than just try and like have this no no i'm going to be strong or whatever you have you enjoy the cheese but the law of diminishing effects is like um, the first bite's going to be the best, like mm. you'll enjoy the most. Then the second bite, yeah, pretty good. By the time you get to like your third or, you know, your fifth piece of, piece of cheese, it's not as great as the first one, <laughs> the first piece. Yeah, of that's so true as well. Yeah. Like a, you know, maybe with a glass of wine as well. So like that first, that first sip or that, you know, that first glass is really enjoyable and you enjoyed it. But if you have the second, it's like, yeah, it was nice, but you maybe didn't enjoy it as much. Mm -hmm. That really makes sense. I think you're yeah, depriving yourself. All you think about is the thing you can't have. And yeah. just having yeah. it sometimes is, is the answer or, yeah. or like we said, sort of surrounding it with other, with other things. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I often think about that, you know, if I've been waiting for that piece of cake or whatever, I just really try and enjoy that, that first part. And then, you know, even if you eat, eat half a piece or, whatever you know just really enjoy it if, exactly. if that's what yeah. you want and um, it makes so much sense <laughs> yeah mm. um sometimes when you know like you go into the health food shop i have a lot of people who who see me for exercise and movement and they've decided to get healthy and they think oh you know that often the next step is i'll go into the health food shop and i'll i'll have a look and see what what else i can buy to like supplements and things like that do you, do you, um, obviously everyone's different, but do you recommend multivitamins and things like that to your clients? Um, not as such. Of course, um, everyone has, like we said, their own health journey and everyone's body is different. They might also be under the guidance of a health practitioner or, or health professional who has worked out that they particularly need that supplement. In essence, though, for most regular people who are having a relatively undernourished diet i would always suggest trying it with food first and give that a good you know a few weeks or a couple of months um, and keep building up those nourishing foods 
and then um, maybe we'll look, potentially have a blood test. I mean, that's a really mm -hmm. simple way to look at mineral and vitamin imbalances. Um, and that can that can guide you because taking supplements of course can be fabulous for some people and really important it can also be quite um, not useful to some people so some minerals can block the absorption of other ones so for instance um, iron and calcium so if you have too much calcium in your diet or it will block the absorption of the iron so someone may have heard oh i don't want osteoporosis i'll take calcium tablets and they take too many and it can just upset the balance of everything else mm -hmm. so there's quite a few important uh minerals that um mineral imbalances that that can occur um through Maybe taking supplements how the body can adjust this through what we eat, you know, like the body's really quite intelligent. Mm, super oh clever. And mostly it can cope and just yeah. give you really expensive urine because you're taking something you don't need. Yeah. Um, and that happens with the water-based uh, supplements. So vitamin C is quite a popular supplement mm. um, and probably one of the most unnecessary, unless you just can't eat fruit because you're allergic to it or something. Um, you only need, uh, I think it's 60 milligrams a day 50, 60 milligrams, and that's basically a kiwi fruit or an orange mm -hmm. a day. Then obviously if you have perhaps two two or three pieces, depending on what your body needs are, um, the vitamin C will help you absorb iron in your food. It's great for skin repair, collagen repair, and it's a great antioxidant for cell repair throughout your body, um, so reducing risk of disease. However, it's very rare someone would ever be vitamin C deficient um, especially in Australia or, or New Zealand. Um, yeah. So. yeah. Interesting. <laughs> um, can we just switch gears a little bit? Um, you did mention earlier that um, environmental toxins can have a, an impact on our health and living on the farm and uh, being aware of how the soil, the health of the soil, um, what's around us can make a big difference. Yeah, totally. Well, there's an area called functional medicine, and that's worth delving into for anyone who's got some health issues that they can't get on top of. And I've read some really interesting research about how the messages, your genetic messaging can actually be changed through um, damage by things like toxins. And that could be all sorts of things. It could have been something that happened to us as a child and we were unaware something that's perhaps these days spraying the classrooms with sanitizer um, yeah. toxins and those sort of things. Yeah. Obviously coming off dry cleaning fluid, um, when we go to the hairdresser, um, hair dye, um, there's toxins absolutely everywhere. All the sprays in parks to keep weeds down. Yeah. Um, and again, on farms, there's a lot of sprays are used mm -hmm. and toxins can also come in the form of skincare. So yeah. anything from sunblock to moisturizer, shampoo, so it's really worth doing your own uh, investigations and research mm -hmm. there as you know, to find out what you're happy to. Then at home, it's actually quite easy to reduce toxins. You don't have as much control when you're out and about, what's going on in the office, what they're using to clean it. You, you, know, you don't have as much say. But in your home, you can certainly clean largely often just with water. And there's all sorts of fantastic ideas you can Google, you know, using vinegar and bicarb and lemon and yeah. all these kinds of things. And for your skin, um, certainly all over the body, I mean, it's easy just to use shea butter, coconut oil, mm -hmm. olive oil, yeah. um, rosehip oil, that kind of thing, aloe, honey. There's some really wonderful ways you can, um, you know, cleanse and rejuvenate without, without putting all those uh, toxins on your okay. skin. And I think it's just reducing, you know, just getting started somewhere. Making yes, reducing, reducing is a key thing. So you might reduce eight things and go, oh, I can't live without this favourite shampoo. Mm -hmm. Well, that's your choice. Yeah. Um, I know people who do it gradually as well. It took me a really long time to give up deodorant. Yes. Sometimes I use like a natural one, but it's just something you have to make. And, adjustment. and yeah, and once you make that change, you, you just feel really good about it. You feel like you've done something else towards, you know, better health outcomes. Yeah. No, so true. And I think some people are more hypersensitive to toxins, environmental toxins too, than others. You know, yeah. like you probably see that with your work, but my daughter Kelsey is super um, sensitive to chemicals in the house. So if, if I use something or something new that's, you know, it's, she's such a, a barometer for if there's a toxin in the house, because she'll just flare up her skin. 
Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Which is probably awful for her, but good for you. It's like yeah. if the barometer, like, okay, she was the canary in the mine. Yeah. Or we even I remember when, when we were when she was younger, she'd flare up and I think, What what have I done that's different? And it could be like a different brand of toothpaste mm -hmm. or it could be anything like that. And um actually was talking to her yesterday, remembering a story about when she was little. So we're driving our old car, which we had when she was little, and um she said, do you remember that time Ben threw up in here? <laughs> and I said, yeah, but she was little. We were on holidays. I was telling, because she was looking at this door stain. And I said, I remember that. And do you remember how sick you got? Because what happened was my husband took the car to a car wash place. They did this vacuum like shampoo thing because it smelled really bad. <laughs> they did this spray in the car, you know, like a, a fragrance. And her whole body, that holiday was a write-off. You know, her whole body just started bleeding, eczema just, it was That's terrible. Awful. So horrible for her. And at the time, we didn't really understand. We're like, oh, we've gone on holidays and she's had this breakout. But looking back now, you have more education. You think, oh, of course, I sprayed that fumes and then I put it back in the car. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why is she, become, she's so sick? Oh, we bandaged her from head to toe. She was really ill. And that was just well, like, quite awful react, of course, but she she did. So And it's interesting because yeah. it might be her body might be actually better than the rest of us because it's saying we really shouldn't be having this. Yeah. And other people probably are getting cell damage in various ways in their body. But um but are unaware. So Yeah. I think our bodies um are the, are that um messenger for us because when you do get it like a skin condition or you're, you're bloated you know you're not sleeping it's your body telling you something's not not right and I think too often we we accept oh this is just how it is I, I have eczema or you know but there's so much we can do and I think giving people hope that we can our bodies want to heal and you know we, we can help them help our bodies along they totally do you're yeah, absolutely spot yeah. on Mm. So, um, talking about going back to your farm in Australia, you, you, I, I read on your website that you farmed aloe, aloe vera. Yes, amongst many other things we did on the farm, mm. aloe vera was a big passion of mine because it's a super amazing little plant. Um, it's packed with nutrients and mm. it's super healing. It's healing for the gut and also. Um, you know, it's purported to help cells throughout the body. Um, and, and yeah, super useful, obviously, on the skin. Yeah, and in actual okay. fact, there was one, one man who so really inspired me a very long time ago, and he had really bad warts all over his hands. Mm -hmm. I think it was a butcher, so it can be quite common for them. You know, he had all these warts, and basically he got rid of them by drinking the juice. He didn't actually put anything on them at all. It took, it took two or three months to have yeah. the juice every day. Yeah, so I was very inspired by this and other mm -hmm. stories. So I grew lots of aloe and, yeah, well, I, I still have grown aloe. It's still waiting for me at the farm. And I created products and did market a market stall at the local farmer's market. And, uh, yeah, it was super fun and inspiring. And um, I had bus groups come and visit and um, we talk about health and the aloe as part of that as well. That's fascinating. <laughs> I'll have to try some juice. I've I've used like you know aloe vera gel, but I've never I've never had the juice before. So yeah, I tend to actually because obviously I'm not home. I have to buy aloe now. <laughs> and sometimes at the local store, it's called Whole Foods. I buy a large aloe leaf, and it's already got all the sticky sap drained out of it, which is a really important step. All that's on on the website. Mm -hmm. And basically, um, once you've drained that out, you can just use the inner gel. And I usually just eat a little bit. Um, or rub it on my skin um, mm -hmm. or on a wound or it gets rid of bruises really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm very moderate with superfoods. A lot of people you hear about get very obsessed and they swear by goji juice or moringa or aloe or whatever the latest. I just let it ebb and flow. So I might have a bit of aloe vera for a week and then not for a month, you know, yeah. just sort of allow the body. Ebb and flow is a really nice phrase to keep in your mind when you talk about life and being well because you know like um i'm probably going to take ben skiing today so it's a big activity day so 
we don't do that every day. It's not like, well, how many hours of exercise should I do a day? I don't, I don't ever think that you should think that in your mind. I should walk for this long. I should do Pilates for this long. Mm -hmm. Should eat this many calories because there's, this, it's just a flow. You know, a big ski day, we're going to crave different kind of foods, um, and then we might have a quiet day where we do our work, and it's a different, you know, sort of looking at things over, like you said, like a month. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, that just brings us to say um, something I was going to mention later, that we don't actually need all food groups every meal all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you, of course you need healthy foods at every meal and it's good if they all count. Um, however, you know, you might, you might be really into, you know, broccoli one week and buy a whole bunch of it and then the next week you don't have any broccoli, you've got a bit of kale mm -hmm. or you've got some mushrooms um and then you suddenly just don't crave those for a while like the other week I had this thing for pineapple and i ate loads of pineapple i felt fantastic and then another day i had some pineapple it stung my lips and my body with my tongue my body was saying i don't want that so i didn't have it so you sometimes just got to listen to what your body needs yeah i like that and also we can't see all the, the mineral imb imbalances and imbalances in our body i mean our body's pretty clever at adjusting it but some of it's obviously um i guess yeah, <laughs> that's great. Good reminders. So just um, to finish up our conversation, what are the things that um, you've, you've just told me already <laughs> about how you eat intuitively, but what are some things you do for your own, you know, mental health and just do you have a few key things you just want to keep in mind that you do for your own self? Wellness. Yeah, I, I really like to focus on thinking positively. So I also seek out positive and inspiring people to yeah, be so with or to watch or listen um, or read about. Um, and try most days to have some part of the day where you're focusing on the here and now. So you might, it might be on a walk. Some people need that walk to actually mull over the work problems, but I like to take at least a portion of that time to only think about here and now and literally focus on that flower, that leaf, that bird you've just seen, um, and let your mind wander into nature um, yep. for some period of time. Um, and obviously, like I said before, I have to work quite hard to, to feel fabulous. I always sort of have had to. So yep. I do yep. set time aside every day to exercise. It could be different. Yesterday was the most massive bike ride I've ever been on in my whole life. Mm -hmm. Wow. Some, I think it was 36 miles, which is about 60 kilometers. Wow. And, um, but another day, I might do a half an hour walk. Or, and of course, I love the Pilates classes. <laughs> so um, that's really that's really fantastic too. So just trying to mix it up a bit. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and eating healthily, obviously, and yeah, being mindful. Um, yeah, well, that's really good tips. I love the one about being in nature. That that resonates with me as well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's all of us benefit. And I think during this COVID lockdown, a lot of people have really struggled with that. And interestingly, even though we're in the US, we haven't really felt that restricted. We can, you know, even during the sort of more severe lockdown in that area, which is Denver, Colorado, we could at least walk around the streets yeah. and get exercise amongst the, you know, the nice street, trees and things. So, yeah, um, yeah very important. Mm. Well, thanks so much, Laura, for chatting with us. We really appreciate your time. And I'll link up um, where people can find you. So if they, if they wanted to reach out and connect, where do, where do they find you? Oh, thank you, Beth. Um, the new website's coming. It's been built as we speak. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, um, you can find me on social media, Instagram or Facebook, and it's called The Natural Space. Um, if anyone wants to message me there, that's fantastic. And also they can message me on my own personal Facebook, which is just Laura Pennington. Okay, that'd be great. So if you've listened to our conversation, why don't you message Laura and thank her and let her know um, what tips she's given that's helped you. That would really encourage her as well. So, um, yeah, we'll, well leave it. Thank you for your time today, Beth. It was fun <laughs> chatting to you. Yeah, excellent. All right, we'll, we'll chat later.